Do you remember the film actress Jean Simmons? She was a star of the Blue Lagoon, Spartacus and other wonderful films of the great days of cinema going. She was beautiful to look at. She was a figure of grace who could portray all types of emotion equally well. Her voice had a haunting quality. She had a face that stole a million hearts. I knew her. She went to my school. It was in the heady days of the early 1930s. Then first World War had become a distant memory. New industries were developing. Modern housing estates were beginning to spring up all around the major towns. We called them suburbs, and the way of life that went with them we called suburban living. Along the new arterial roads of concrete, built for the rapidly growing fleets of petrol-driven monsters, came strings of new buildings of a modern style. We called it ribbon development. Less and less we saw the horse and cart. We, who were young then, looked forward to a dream world, where perhaps we would be able to live in some of the more attractive buildings. The cinema reigned supreme. Week by week we would queue at the local Regal or Odeon to sit on upholstered seats in the dark to gaze at the latest offering from Elm's Tree or Hollywood. In those luxurious palaces we would watch on the screen wonderful drama set in luxurious surroundings in the vast spaces of a distant land. It was a lifestyle almost beyond the imaginings of us dwellers living in endless look-alike buildings, gasping through the winter fogs. At the cinema we discovered a dream world opening up before our eyes. Secretly we all became stars in the new era that was awaiting us. Tomorrow would be our day. As I've already told you, I lived in the North London borough of Hornsey, a sprawling, hilly area covered with endless streets of red brick buildings built in the 19th century with the spread of Victorian population. The noisy railway to the north pierced its heart. The coal wagons cluttered along. Now and then the flying Scotsman rattled through on its way to the far north, and sounding its whistle to let us know it was on its way to distant parts. It had an errand. We were but witnesses. There was no time to stop for the likes of us. We could only watch from the bridge as it scattered its soot upon us. I was being educated about a mile away from the rooms I shared with my mother. It was called the Hornsey County School, although geographically it was located in Haringey. It had been founded early in the century. There was something special about it, unusual for that generation. It was a mixed school. Teenage boys and girls shared the same classrooms. It was certainly a new experience to me, because to this date, because of my isolated existence at the top of the house, I did not have much contact with girls of my age. At art I excelled. As a creative writer, the teachers were generous in their comments. But I wanted to be a sports star. The journey to school was more or less one mile. Every day after morning lessons I would run home for lunch as my mother could not afford school dinners. Then I would run the mile back for the afternoon lessons, so it was normal to run several miles each day. 
Coming home was different. We sorted along as an animated group. Skinner, Wilmot, Smithy and me. On becoming school cross-country champion and a promising miler when I reached senior level, I began to represent my school at special events. One of my classmates throughout was a very good quarter miler. He had an unusual high-stepping style that made him very distinctive. He was rather different from the other lads in the class. He was very gentlemanly, rather quiet and respectful. He always spoke with a careful pronunciation and not given to the slang and the Americanisms which the rest of us were picking up. He was always smartly dressed, but never a show-off. He lived in a different part of the borough from the rest of us. When we set off home each afternoon, he would set off in the direction of nearby Strow Green. His name, by the way, was Bob Simmons. It was during our last year at school that I discovered that Bob had a sister some year or so younger than the rest of us. She had been educated at a girls' school, but had now been transferred to our co-ed SEPUP. I found out about this when I noticed that when afternoon classes finished, Bob began to wait at the school gate until a pretty young girl joined him. Then they set off up the road together towards Strow Green. Sometimes, as I waited for my own gang to appear, I would be standing with Bob at the school gate when his sister joined him. She was so pretty. She had such a nice smile. Bye, she would say as they set off on their home route, which differed from my own. Bob called her Jean. In the course of time, I had the courage to say, Hello, Jean, as I waited at the gate. Skinner and Co. began to notice that I always got to the school gate before they did, and commented on the fact. I just told them it was because I was a bit smarter than them. One afternoon... Bob had to stay behind in the classroom because he needed to consult the master about something. He asked me to take a message to Jean to ask her to wait for him. So it was that I stationed myself at the school gate. In a few minutes the little vision appeared, her eyes gleaming and with a smile which seemed to say she was glad I had waited, though she did not in fact say that. She just asked where Bob was, I explained. I said I would wait too. Oh, there's no need, she said, but I gathered that she did not mind if I did stay. Skinner and party hung around for a couple of minutes, then announced that they were not going to wait. I told them I would catch them up. To tell the truth, I did not catch them up that afternoon. Bob seemed a long time. I did not mind waiting. I didn't mind in the least. But I didn't know what to talk about. Jean started talking about the book she was reading and asked if I had read it. I had to admit that I had never seen the book in question. I learned that she read a lot of books, and it soon became clear that she had a very vivid imagination. I go regularly to Stroud Green Library, she informed me. When do you go? I asked. Oh, usually on Wednesday evenings, she informed me. Quite a few others from my class go there as well, she added. That is how my interest in libraries began. 
I soon found that some of my own classmates went there. Not only that, I found that it was the meeting place for a number of pretty girls as well as Jean on Wednesday evenings. Jean looked different on Wednesday evenings. Instead of her school uniform, she wore her favourite dresses and looked quite a young lady. I would watch the swirl of cloth as she pivoted on the curb outside the library entrance and sometimes dramatically dance a few steps along the pavement. She had a very willing audience. So the library became part of my curriculum. When I say that I went regularly to the library, it would be more correct to say that the library became a meeting place. It is true we exchanged books there, but there were verbal exchanges which took place after the borrowed books were stamped, and the verbal exchanges went on after the daylight had faded and the street lamps cast their orange glow. On Thursday mornings there always seemed to be a lot of explaining to be done about the quality of the homework submitted that had been set for Wednesday evenings. Of course, the library didn't just open on Wednesday evenings for the benefit of eager, school-age, literary students. It opened every day, except Sunday. There was no end to our literary zeal if the weather was kind. To get down to facts, I began to see Jean more than once a week. It is strange how... Casual remarks can lead to teasing remarks, and teasing remarks to more demonstrable behaviour. I liked it when Jean chased me down the road as a result of some smart remark. Once she chased me all the way to the Stroud Green Gate of Finsbury Park, and I hid in the shrubbery, but only for a moment she arrived out of breath as I jumped out on her. It took her a while to get her breath back. It seemed a long walk back to the library. Perhaps not really a long walk, but it took some time. Then she realised how late it was. I must fly, she gasped, and off she hurried, clutching a library book. I made my way home, recalling over and over again the events of the evening. How dull our two rooms were at the top of the house. I could never invite a girlfriend there. Then came the day of the special race at a sports day at a school some miles away. Both Bob and I had been selected to represent our school at the unusual distance of 600 yards, which was neither a sprint nor a middle distance race. We were to compete with the cream of all the schools of that part of Middlesex. Both and Bob and I agreed to travel together as the race was to take place outside the borough of Hornsey. It was an exciting prospect. I arrived early at the agreed bus stop, so had some time to wait. At last, Bob appeared from a side turning. But he was not alone. Jean was with him. This was totally unexpected. I did not know what to say, although my face must have shown how pleased I was. She looked at me rather shyly and smiled. You know the way she looks when she smiled in her films. It was the same softening of the muscles that brought a dimple and her bright teeth appeared and there was a mischievous sparkle in her eye. We were doing something together. It took my mind off the race ahead. Imagine my delight when it so happened that we sat side by side on the bus and talked about the stories one or another of us had read. The journey seemed so much shorter than anticipated. We reached our destination. It was one of the posh schools of the area. Good luck, said Jean, as Bob and I went to look for the changing rooms. For days I had looked forward to this race, but now it felt as if I had achieved selection to the Olympic Games. Bob and I were ready 
in plenty of time for our race, and stood side by side at the starting line while an official announced the identity of the competitors. We were representing our school. It was wonderful to feel and to hear, hear the fact announced to the hundreds of spectators. It was a sunny day, but with a strong wind blowing across the arena. I noted this because Joan had long hair at that time, and she was allowing it to blow free, and it kept blowing across her face as she stood there in the third row of the spectators in the stand. I had no difficulty in picking her out. There was nobody there as pretty as Jean. I glanced across at her, and she lightly fluttered the fingers of her left hand. Such delicate fingers! I felt a proud young athlete as I stood there awaiting the signal to start the race. She had come to watch me. I stood there poised and confident. The starter held us back for what seemed an age. I relaxed. I glanced again at the third row of spectators. Jean's hand was raised to her lips. Was she blowing me a kiss? Momentarily, I lost concentration. Suddenly the race was on. I had ground to make up because of my slow start. It was a fast race. I did not make up the ground I had lost at the start. Bob did not fare any better. Neither of us managed to get in the first three. The crowd cheers the winner, not the losers. No matter. There was still the journey home to look forward to. Again it happened that Jean and I sat by side. It was nice to talk about the films we had seen and the films we'd like to see. I did not dare to ask her to go to the pictures with me, though I wanted to. Instead, I summoned up the courage to tell her my secret. I would like to be in a Tarzan film, I said. I'd like to be a film star too, Jean said quietly. In fact, so quietly that I turned to look at her and saw how she was gazing dreamily out of the window of the bus as it made its way among the endless houses. You would make a good film star, I assured her. You have the looks, you have the voice. I must have said it very convincingly, because I thought for a moment she'd rested her head on my shoulder, but only for a moment. Bob was looking at us very much in a big brother fashion. We were silent as we moved on beyond the next few bus stops while she sat gazing out of the window. You remember how powerful her silences could be. A penny for them, I said, in the way people do. She just lifted her eyebrows and sighed swung her arm in a descriptive gesture and gazed out of the window again. I watched with a strange fascination. I pictured her on the silver screen. I was awed by the experience. Jean and I had become close friends. The walks that followed in Finsbury Park and later in Highgate Woods were meandering chatterings as I watched the maturing of the deportment of the schoolgirl turning into an assured young lady. I listened to the outpouring of beautiful poetry which she had selected and learned by heart. I loved to watch the sparkle of her dancing eyes, the gleam of moisture on her open lips, the delicate touch of her fingers as she grasped my arm to draw my attention to some phenomenon which had caught her eye. The little girl became a mature young woman. What I saw on the cinema screen I began to see on the streets of Hornsey as she honoured me by her company. People turned to look as she passed majestically by, and she was my friend. In school hours, to see her glide across the assembly hall with a pile of books was a delight to behold. Her shoulders pulled back to distribute the weight, and a small chin sweetly poised on the topmost book of the pile to prevent it falling to the ground. She saw me standing there as I returned from locking up the cycle shed. 
She pursed her lips and raised one eyebrow, then disappeared down the corridor to her classroom where she was delivering the consignment of books. Had she been winking? I could not be sure. Why should such mundane incidents remain in the memory? It was because she was my friend. Jean Simmons was my friend. I carried their memory memories long afterwards. Sweet Jean. Selecting a Christmas card was a lengthy process. I wanted it to be something special, but the shops all seemed to sell the same range of pictures and the same messages. I narrowed the selection to those which contained the word love, prominently displayed, but in the end I chose a card with a deep purple sky and a shining star. For that is how I thought of her, and a star she would always be. We were both interested in play-acting, and took our place in the various school presentations. I thought she was wonderful, as with great feelings she moved around the stage in the school hall. New meanings seemed to come to Shakespeare's ageless English as she created pictures from a single sentence. But my school days came to an end. I joined the old Hosean's drama group, and Jean came along to see my performance as second lead in the charm school. You were very good, she assured me. Out in the world, my school days found me with things not going too well. After the dreams of school days came the reality of working life. Those were the days of depression. Jobs were scarce. I had to settle for a factory job with long hours and low pay. On ten shillings a week there's a limit to what an aspiring young man could do in his spare time. It was embarrassing to meet former school acquaintances. A smart family like the Simmons was out of my league. I could not invite Jean to our two rooms at the top of an old house. One cannot live on dreams. Like ships that pass in the night, we travel along the same footpaths for a while, though bound for different destinations. Jean Simmons achieved her dreams. She became a star. For some of us, our job is to reflect rather than to shine.